Well, good afternoon, just everybody. Uh, this um, was going to be a lecture, but I decided it would be better to do a sort of fireside chat. So this is the session of which all those questions you've wondered about in cosmology but have been afraid to ask will be answered. And so I would like you to feel free to interrupt. But I'd like to say, first of all, what a pleasure it is to be back here in Hampstead. So I grew up within walking distance of where we are now, somewhere over there. And uh, as a teenager, I'd love to walk over Hampstead Heath and look up at the sky. You could still see it in those days and uh, wonder about how the universe came to be put together. And I was determined to make a career in cosmology, theoretical physics with special applications to astrophysics and cosmology. And I did. I've lived through the golden age of cosmology, where it's gone from a speculative backwater, such a long time ago, I daren't tell you, uh, speculative backwater when I was a, a student, to uh, a precision science today. And like all golden ages in science, a lot of questions get answered, but then a lot of new questions appear. And we're very far from understanding the universe in its entirety. And so I'm pleased there's some young people here, and maybe people who are even working in science or thinking about science, there's still a lot left to do. And so now I work in Arizona, at Arizona State University. And again, it's a pleasure to be back in cloudy London after the unrelenting blue skies and warm sunshine <laughs> of, of Arizona. But the, the great advantage of having blue sky is that it's good for astronomy. And so Arizona's like a world center for astronomy. Now, it's been many decades since I've actually looked through a telescope. It's all done up here. It's theoretical physics for me, so it's equations and concepts. Um, but a lot of people do practical astronomy. And in a sense, cosmology began in Arizona. I think it's not well known. Uh, to the north of Phoenix, where I live, is a town called Flagstaff. And there, in the 1890s, a rich businessman, Percival Lowell, built an observatory to look for Martians. He believed that Mars was inhabited, and the Martians had built canals. And he built this observatory to make maps of the canals of Mars. You can still see them. He published a book, he, these maps. Entirely figment of his imagination. But meanwhile, a secondary project was taking place, a little-known astronomer called Vesto Slipher. And he was interested in the fuzzy patches that you see in the sky. Uh, you can even see some with the naked eye. Uh, these are called nebulae. And there was a big debate around about 1900. Were the nebulae like other Milky Ways, way, way out, uh, full of stars, or were they just patches of gas within our own Milky Way? And he studied those, and he found a very curious thing, that the fainter ones, the color was redder than the brighter ones. Uh, and he had a ready explanation for that, because if something's rushing away from us, the light is shifted towards the red. It's called the red shift. It's well understood. It was understood at the time. So he deduced that um, the ones that are farther away were receding faster. And this came to the attention of a pipe-smoking astronomer called Ed Edwin Hubble. Uh, and you probably heard of Hubble. And so Hubble took Slipher's results and confirmed that these with a bigger telescope at Mount Wilson, confirmed that these um, fainter fuzzy patches were in fact galaxies in their own right, like the Milky Way. And then he published, in all places, the New York Times in 1924, uh, the declaration that the universe is expanding, that these other uh, galaxies were rushing away from us. And that immediately raised the question, uh, well, if the universe is getting bigger, it must have been smaller in the past. Uh, and so if you go back billions of years, everything was squashed together in one place. What did that mean? Where did it come from? And nobody was really uh, prepared to grasp the nettle at that stage. It fell to uh, a Belgian priest uh, at, at, uh, in the late 1920s uh, called uh, the Abbe Lemaitre, Georges Lemaitre. Uh, and he said, well, what this means is that the universe burst into existence in what later became called the Big Bang. And so the genesis of that was back in the 1920s. But it fell on deaf ears. Einstein wrote to Lemaitre and said um, that uh, your equations are good, but your physics is atrocious. So nobody really wanted to believe it. Uh, and fast forward some decades. Uh, so when I was a student, I keep alluding to this. And stop me if it's too boring. Uh, it's what happens when you get old. You 
think a lot about your youth. Um, but uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, there was an alternative theory of the universe called the steady state theory. And that said that as the universe uh, expands, new matter uh, is, uh, trickles in continuously. So there wasn't a, a big bang. In fact, the person who, the architect of the steady state theory, Fred Hoyle, at Cambridge University, he coined the term Big Bang as a term of derision. He was on some radio program and he said, and some people think that the universe began, you know, with just a big bang. Um, and so he didn't like that idea at all. But uh, in 1964, two radio engineers at the Bell Labs in New Jersey accidentally discovered an annoying hiss coming from space. And uh, what they deduced after a lot of uh, tests was that this hiss was in fact microwaves from the Big Bang. It's like the fading afterglow. If the universe began with this uh, de very dense state, it would have been very hot. And that heat hasn't got anywhere to go. It's still in the universe today. It bathes the whole universe at about three degrees above absolute zero. They detected it, and it was immediately apparent that there must have been a Big Bang, but also that buried in that background heat radiation would be really important information about the first split second of the universe. And so over the decades, a number of satellites have been launched. There's one up there at the moment called Planck, European Space Agency, to map that heat radiation with extraordinary precision. Uh, and some of you may know what I'm talking about, a sort of color-coded heat map of the sky, um, usually that shape uh, with uh, blue and red blotches, uh, slightly uh, hotter and slightly cooler parts. The, the overwhelming result that you get from mapping this radiation is that it's extraordinarily smooth across the sky. The radiation over there and the radiation over there, the temperatures match uh, to uh, within a few parts per million. But on smaller scales, there are slight variations. And there have better be, because those variations represent, uh, back in the early universe, slight increase or decrease of density of material. And when you had denser material, the gravitational pull was greater. And so they, what those uh, cooler bits represent is denser patches. They like the seeds of the clusters of galaxies. So without that, uh, there would be no galaxies, no stars, and no people to celebrate what a wonderful universe we're in. So it began in a state of perfect, uh, but not totally, of almost perfect, but not totally perfect uniformity. Uh, and uh, I myself worked, I, I should just throw this in, self-commercial, in the 1970s. Uh, and this is how science gets done. In the 1970s, uh, I had a student by the name of Tim Bunch. I was at King's College in London in those days. And uh, we were trying to solve the equations of quantum physics in an expanding universe. Uh, and we'd done sort of one or two examples. And there's a particular example that where the equations are easy, and it's a universe that doubles in size in a fixed time. Some people know that's called an exponential growth. Uh, and uh, so I got Tim to work on that, and he solved everything wonderfully, and we published all that. And we thought, well, nobody's ever going to be interested in quantum effects in this, uh, it's called de Sitter space, this expanding space. And it, it was only about three years later that suddenly uh, the favored theory of the Big Bang uh, burst on the scene. It's called the inflationary universe scenario. And it says that in the first split second of the universe, it leapt in size by an enormous factor, as if like the universe had taken a sudden deep breath and it just ballooned up. And then that uh, it slowed down to a, a more sedate expansion. And that ballooning phase was precisely what Tim and I had, had worked on. Uh, and so if you, if you take those equations and apply them uh, to the early universe, you get that pattern of ripples. We wouldn't be here without that particular quantum effect. So it's really like quantum fluctuations writ large and frozen in the sky. Uh, yes, yes uh, because this, this is a long story. Yes, yes, a lady here. We have a big bang, and you said, and it expanded exponentially and then slowed down. Yes. Now yes, you're absolutely right. Applies a switch. The question is, uh, I've said, you know, I'm gabbling through this, that in the first split second, the universe ballooned in size, it expanded exponentially, then it, uh, that stopped, and it's now, uh, then after that it was expanding at a decelerating rate. Very briefly, why is that? Gravity 
is the dominating force in cosmology. Gravity, as you know, is a pulling force. It keeps our feet on the ground. It pulls on the galaxies. So as the universe was expanding... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.